Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this video in which we review the last part of the first chapter of T.M. Scanlon's book, What We Owe to, uh, to Each Other. Um, I hope you're doing great. Uh, happy, uh, happy holidays and happy uh, new, uh, new year. Um, if you are watching uh, this video during the, uh, the holiday period, well, I am... Uh, I congratulate you on your devotion to, uh, to philosophy instead of being with your friends and family. Or if you are watching this because you don't have any friends or family, well, in both cases, good for you. So, last time we uh, talked about uh, how Scanlon identifies, you know, uh, reasons and he distinguishes them from, from desires. And so we talked about how, you know, desires cannot really be appealing, uh, cannot, cannot really uh, form uh, accounts in favor of some uh, of, of your actions and uh, and beliefs, and Scanlon uh, argues that reasons would be a better candidate for that. But Scanlon here identifies a certain issue with reasons that can explain why people would tend to appeal to desires in order to explain their actions or belief. And this issue is the epistemological and metaphysical doubt that we have about the notion of reason. Now, this means that there is an uncertainty revolving around the notion of reason when reason is not derived from desire, which is the point that Scanlon been, uh, been making uh, so far. Like, desires are easily understandable and common elements of our psychological makeup. Uh, if reasons are derived from desires, then there is no inherent difficulty in explaining how we possess reasons or how we come to know what you know uh, what reasons we uh, we have however if reasons are not connected to desires there arises a complexity about what reasons actually are uh, they do not appear to be either inherent aspects of our psychology or fundamental components of the world independent of our subjective experience if reasons are not connected to desires, then it means that reasons are somehow outside of us, that they affect us from the outside. But when we look at the outside, we don't seem to find reasons out there. But that reasons are always uh, linked to our subjective experience. So, what are reasons? You know, what is a reason? Now, for Scanlon, it is a misleading question because in his words, it suggests that reasons are a special ontological class. What is special about reasons is not the ontological category of things that can be reasons, but rather the status of being a reason. That is to say, of counting in favor of some judgment-sensitive attitude. So in other words, for Scanlon, reasons are not floating in the air or simply, you know, forming into, uh, inside our minds. They are not entities on their own. They are, uh, they are neither subjective nor objective entities, but rather it is things that are reasons. And anything can be a reason, like anything can serve as an account in favor of some judgment-sensitive attitude. For example, Skellen says, imagine that I don't buy a hat because of its color. Here he says, when I am deciding what to do, and hence considering reasons in the standard normative sense, what is relevant is something about the hat, not about my uh, state of mind. What is meant is that reasons are, unlike beliefs, that, uh, that the hat is of a certain color is a reason for me not to buy it. I believe that a hat of that color is reason not to buy it. And likewise, if I have a friend who wants to buy that hat, uh, that me telling him that it has an ugly color can hurt his feelings and that can be a reason not to tell him. So reasons are first and foremost operative, meaning that they serve to do certain operations uh, in the sense of an action. You know, they help doing actions. Um, they are processes, if you want, like the color of the hat becomes a reason for me to either buy it or not, to either perform that operation or not, to either do that process or not. So a reason can be the content of a belief, which means propositions. Propositions about the natural world, like the color of the hat. That hat is, for example, uh, they ingo pink, 
for example that is a proposition and i believe that the hat is uh, of that of that color and so that belief serves as a reason to buy it or not propositions can also be about our moods or our psychological states that i am grieving for example can be a reason not to go to a party however in order for these beliefs to be reasons there has to be something more because why would the color of the hat or my grief be a reason for me uh, either you know not to buy the hat or not to go to the party to say that the hat is this color is one thing but saying that the color is a good reason for me to buy the hat or not to buy the hat is another thing so the belief that i shouldn't buy the hat because of its color is something different from just stating the color of the hat it seems that reasons are also facts about the world but we don't know which part of the world that is, uh, you know, that, uh, that this, for example, when I say this hat is blue, that corresponds to a part of the world, the part where the hat is blue. I can find that fact, let's say, about the hat by looking at the hat. I can see, you know, the fact, I can see that the hat is blue, but the fact being blue isn't good for the hat, or isn't a good reason for me to buy the hat, that fact isn't there. You don't see that evaluative or normative content. Why should the judgment that the hat is blue have any influence on your attitude towards the hat? Uh, why can't you just be, for example, neutral towards the hat? And so this is the problem that we already mentioned in the introduction when we talked about Hume's guillotine. Uh, quote, the judgment that such a proposition would, if it were true, or if a person had good grounds for believing it, be a reason, be a good reason for some action or belief, contains an element of normative force which resists identification with any proposition about the natural world. So what do we mean by a reason being a good reason for an action or a belief? One can say that for something to be a good reason, one simply needs to know the relevant facts and assess them in the right way. But the problem is that both relevant and right way are basically synonymous with good. And so we are stuck with the same problem. Relevant and right are normative properties, which leads us to ask, what do we mean by relevant or right? Just like when we ask, what do we mean by good? What makes a reason a good reason? You know, uh, not, not, only, uh, not only that, but as Scanlon been arguing all along, even if relevant and right are propositions about the natural world and we're capable of apprehending them, although maybe some would do it better than others, it doesn't mean that people, even though vividly aware of them, would be moved by, you know, those, uh, by those propositions. Like a server servant who is aware vividly of the consequences of taking, taking bribes, for example, uh, like he assessed all the relevant facts and in the right way, can still take the bribe. So we can then try to remove the non-natural properties of right and relevant and replace them by natural or neutral ones that are free from question begging. Now, question begging, uh, question begging is a fallacy where you put the conclusion as the first premise in an argument, like I'm going to prove to you that my reasons are good reasons by starting my argument with my reasons are good, you know? So if I say that these are the relevant facts, relevant can be a question begging because how am I to prove that these are the relevant facts? You know, by starting with, uh, with uh, these are the relevant facts, you know, that would be question begging, that would be a fallacy. So non-natural properties can often fall into question begging so let's remove them but then when we say that x is a reason only if it is a uh, only if it is a reason under condition c for example and c isn't a question begging uh, condition then we end up with a dualist approach in which x is a normative claim while the other part c is just stating facts but then they have no appealing force, and so they cannot move X. Quote, as long as C is free of such phrases, the question I would not regard R as a reason, even under consideration C, but is, uh, but is it a reason nonetheless, will have an open feel. 
Now by open field, Scallon here uh, makes a reference to the philosopher G. E. Moore. Uh, G. E. Moore is famous for what we call the open question argument that states that attempts to define concepts in terms of naturalistic or non-moral properties are going to fail because one can always uh, intelligibly ask the question, well, is that, uh, is that which is defined as good really good? Like any attempt to reduce moral concepts to non-moral uh, or naturalistic properties is flawed because he argues that goodness is a fundamental irreducible concept that cannot be analyzed in terms of anything else. So anything that you are going to use in order to justify goodness well, we can always ask the question, well, is that really goodness? Because it seems that you are reducing the good to something that you cannot reduce it to. And so we're stuck. It's like, you know, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it becomes impossible to define if X is a reason, because we can always ask if X is really a reason or a good reason. Like if we define the good as happiness, for example, more asks, is the good really happiness? And you'll soon discover that the good cannot be reduced to happiness. Same thing with reasons. You cannot reduce them to their conditions if those conditions are non-moral or non-normative. And if the conditions are normative, well then, what is differentiating them from reasons? If conditions on their own are normative, well then, they are reasons. And so, Scanlon asks, how are we to define reasons in this uh, in, this, uh, in these circumstances. How can we interpret a judgment X, a reason for doing A? And so he points to two possible interpretations. First, we can do what we call a belief-based interpretation. According to this view, accepting that the judgment X is a reason for doing, uh, for doing A involves holding a belief that the relation of uh, counting in favor of holds between X and A. And so how, how does this uh, relation hold? Well, the belief is that the relation isn't, natu uh, isn't a natural one, but a non-natural one. Meaning that we just, believe, we just believe it to be the case because it's impossible to explain in terms of science, let's say, or in terms of natural facts. So counting in favor of is considered non-natural in the sense that it is not something that can be fully understood or explained purely in terms of naturalistic, empirical, or scientific language. Like, it belongs to a different category of facts, one that deals with normative or evaluative considerations. Suppose, suppose that you believe that promoting happiness is a reason for giving to charity. In this case, you are asserting that there is a normative or evaluative fact about promoting happiness, which counts in favor of taking actions like giving to charity. You believe that the promotion of happiness, let's call that, you know, uh, the judgment X, provides a reason for you uh, to take the action of giving to charity, which is A. So this belief is grounded in your ethical or moral framework, which holds that actions aimed at uh, increasing happiness have normative weight or normative value. And so this belief is not reducible to naturalistic claims because it's not merely a description of the physical world. It involves a judgment about what is morally right or valuable. And so this interpretation has the problem of just, you know, you just assert the belief without explaining it. You know, happiness must be promoted because happiness is good. Well, that's just a belief that you assert. Like, in, you haven't, like, how can you demonstrate that happiness is good or that happiness must be promoted? You know? And so this can be convenient since it rules out the possibility of having to explain the belief. Since all of my explanations are going to be factual in the sense naturalistic, then I'll just say that my belief and, uh, I mean, I just state my belief and holds it because it is what my moral framework tells me, and so that's it. But this is question begging. And so we can have a second alternative, which is an attitude-based interpretation. So here, one can uh, argue that taking X to be a reason for doing A is not just a matter of belief, but it involves a special kind of judgment-sensitive attitude towards X and towards A. So this attitude is described as taking X, uh, taking X to count in favor of doing A. 
And here, uh, Scanlon refers to the philosopher Alan uh, Gibbert, who supports this view by saying, when a person calls something, let's call it R, a reason for doing X, he expresses his acceptance of norms that say to treat R as weighting in favor of doing, uh, weighing in favor of doing X. And so here, recognizing something as a reason involves a specific attitude or stance towards it rather than just holding a belief about it. You know, you also adopt norms, you also adopt a certain attitude. So let's consider an example to illustrate this. Suppose you believe that helping those in need is a reason for action. According to the special attitude-based approach, this belief would involve not just acknowledging this fact, but also adopting a certain attitude towards it. So, in addition to holding, uh, to holding the belief, you also adopt a specific attitude, a genuine concern for the well-being of, uh, of, the, of the people in need. And so this attitude is not just intellectual, it involves a deeper emotional response that goes beyond mere belief. And so this interpretation emphasize, uh, emphasizes that recognition that recognizing something as a reason involves more than just you know acknowledging uh, acknowledging effect it uh, <clears throat> sorry it entails a deeper emotionally engaged uh, attitude towards it and so this uh, this attitude is you know what gives uh, the reasons the reason it's normative force and motivates uh, action so here the uh, Gabardian, let's say, interpretation involves more than belief, but also norms that someone has to accept in order to be moved by that belief. So doing A is an expression of the acceptance of those norms and of that belief. And so this would solve the question begging problem and the open question uh, objection raised earlier because those objections are legitimate against theoretical and hypothetical propositions but uh, about what is about what is a good reason uh, and so it is a challenge to a belief but it's not really a challenge to an attitude and here we are talking about an attitude and so even if you convince me that the belief I hold is question begging or is an open question, it doesn't affect my attitude since it wasn't the belief itself that was moving me to act out on that belief. So just like I can fail to be moved by a belief, I can also be failed, uh, I can also fail to be moved by the criticism of that belief, you know. And so in short, the belief-based approach fails because, quote, a belief account cannot explain the normative force of judgments about reasons, that it involves implausible, implausible metaphysical claims, and that it can offer no plausible epistemology for such uh, judgments. And so, by contrast, the attitude-based approach can be better because a special attitude account, therefore, seems more plausible insofar as it understands taking something to be a reason as expressing a certain attitude rather than registering the truth of some fact outside us. Now, it is important to note that Skellen doesn't reject the, uh, the belief account, but rather blames it for neglecting the importance of attitudes. The, for, for reasons to, to move us. In reality, both accounts can't really, uh, aren't really different if they are taken as they really are, meaning as they are both entail the other. After all, I mean, the special attitude account would still rely on a belief account in order to express its acceptance to the norm. Like someone who doesn't believe in God, for example, is less likely to develop the special attitude of accepting the norms that come with religion as in, you know, for doing the five prayers a day or fasting during Ramadan if you are Muslim. And so if we accept the objections raised against the belief-based account, then we'd be saying something like, there is nothing true about belief, it's just an expression of an attitude, which is not what Skellen is saying. So in order to have a judgment-sensitive attitude, beliefs, beliefs must be believed, meaning that they have to be true at least for the person holding them which means that they can also be false to that person and therefore they can be a way to assess their truth and uh, 
falsity. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to criticize the attitudes of people if their attitude is problematic. If we do, then we'll hold a belief about their attitude, which will express an attitude on our behalf. But then that belief wouldn't be true. And so why are we criticizing the attitude of the other person in the first place? So since beliefs hold to logical laws and that when one comes to uh, recognize something as a reason, they also hold it to be true, then the belief account is safe from the objection raised above. So here, Skellen will reject skepticism about the truth value of reasons. Reasons must level up to the standards of truth and falsity. As he says, if recognizing something to be a reason amounts to seeing, uh, <coughs> sorry, amounts to seeing uh, the truth of a statement about reasons, then this recognition will have normative force uh, of the requisite kind. So if there are judgments about reasons that are naturally expressed as declarative sentences and are held with uh, confidence, then it is reasonable to conclude that these judgments convey something true about their subject matter. What is their subject matter? Well, that reasons X are good reasons, meaning that they count in favor of a certain attitude and that this attitude is appropriate to the situation in which it is involved. And so, as Cannon says, quote, the judgment in question involves taking something to be true, namely that for a person in a certain situation, X counts in favor of holding uh, attitude A, or that person in a certain situation has sufficient reasons to adopt A or to modify it. And so the judgment about the reasons that I have to do X aren't just judgments about those reasons, but beliefs about those reasons. Uh, I take those reasons to be true, for example, and I accept those reasons. And so individuals who accept these judgments, if rational, will inco incorporate them into their uh, further deliberations. This is the prerequisite for being a rational creature. We see the motivational force of our reasons and act out on it either to reinforce or to modify our behavior and attitude. So it must be the case in order to be a rational creature or a reasonable one that our theoretical beliefs about practical reasoning have an effect on our practical reasoning and our attitude. So in other words, if I believe that I should think critically, then I have to think critically. But now we return to the real challenge of, you know, the belief account, which is, well, what justifies it? What justifies the, norm the normative part of a belief? We already said that it is neither objective nor subjective. So where are we to find the correspondence that stealing is wrong? You know, where are reasons? What are they? And so we fall back into the problem of metaphysics. What are reasons? And we also fall back on the problem of epistemolo uh, epistemology. How can we recognize them or know them? And so how can I know that I am recognizing a reason when I say I shouldn't hurt my friend's feelings or when I say it's okay to hurt their feelings when we are in a competition, for example? How do I know that I really have a good reason? How can I avoid open question arguments? Well, Skellen says that it is true that reasons are neither objective nor subjective, but they are both. First, we need to understand that we can't apply these uh, questions about metaphysics and epistemology to reasons like we apply them to the natural world. Normative reasons and empirical facts aren't the same and cannot be treated the same. When we ask how can I know or where are reasons, we treat reasons like we treat regular empirical knowledge. Like, for example, when I, when I ask, does, does the fish exist? Does the fish really exist? Or how do I know that the fish I am seeing is an actual fish? Uh, maybe that's an illusion. Do I have a method to know, to be certain? These, can't, uh, these questions cannot really apply to reasons, or at least not in this way. Uh, or, you know, we can, we can apply them. Uh, we can apply them. Uh, but as we said before, uh, we, can, we, we cannot apply them in the same way because, as we said before, ethics is about uh, practical reasoning. 
if going on in metaphysics and epistemology about ethics doesn't result in uh, practical thinking, then we are wasting our time. The problem becomes less challenging if you look at reasons in an analogous way to mathematics, for example. Uh, judgments about arithmetic involve uh, claims about a subject matter, independent of the individual making the judgment, but that doesn't have to rely, for example, on the belief uh, in mathematical Platonism, uh, the view that mathematical entities have an objective existence outside of us, you know? Like, instead, uh, in mathematics, we require adherence to a standard of reasoning. And competence in arithmetic is demonstrated by the ability to use these standards efficiently. So, judgments about right and wrong, about reasons, are also like that. They are like mathematical reasoning. They do not require that, uh, that the things we are thinking about exist independently of us, as if they are outside of us, they occupy a dimension, uh, a dimension in which we are not. They don't need that in order to be considered objective. And so this is what Scanlon calls substantive moral realism as opposed to dogmatic rationalism. Uh, moral realism is the idea that there are moral facts, but some would insist that those truths are completely outside outside of us, and hence we can only have a dogmatic, rational approach if we hope to reach them. On the, by, by contrast, substantive moral uh, realism, uh, which Skellen takes from another philosopher called Christine uh, Korsgaard, um, now this, uh, this moral uh, reason, uh, realism argues that uh, moral realism isn't something that is outside, but it rises from within. Uh, now here, Skellen uh, actually prefers the term procedural rather than substantive, but I believe this is just a, uh, just a technicality that we don't really need to focus on. Uh, the point is that moral realism can be objective if we take them from a substantive point of view, as in terms that, meaning that they arise from a specific situation and specific circumstance of, you know, a, of an individual point of view. So that's, uh, that's what it meant. Uh, like what, it, what is meant is that what is going to determine the objectivity of moral claim isn't, uh, isn't that they exist outside of us and, you know, or by the power of dogmatic uh, reason we arrive at them, but rather the way we arrive at them, uh, which for each individual is different, given their different situation, their different backgrounds, their different, their different faculties, etc. So what matters uh, in the objectivity of morality is the methodology. Uh, and so this is what also shows the difference between uh, mathematics and ethics. Like, as we said, they, they, can, they, they can be similar, but they have a difference. Uh, like, they do have that similarity of not having to be uh, metaphysic. Uh, they don't have to metaphysically exist outside of us uh, where we don't exist. They still have differences on grounds of their substantive methodology. And that difference is, you know, is, uh, is caused by the difference of these two subject matter. So, on the one hand, we have mathematical judgments, which are, quote, incontrovertibly correct, and there are general methods or, uh, of uh, unassa unassailable authority for arriving at them. As far as reasons for action are concerned, however, although there are some judgments about what counts in favor of action, a certain, uh, of acting a certain way, that uh, command wide acceptance. There is also wide disagreement about reasons for action, and if uh, and it seems nothing like a general authoritative method for reaching such conclusions. So, the main difference is that uh, arithmetic uh, and mathematics are generally held as correct without sparking much contro controversy. The methods in math are general, and it's rare to have you know. Uh, divergence uh, or disagreements uh, about them. Um, but ethics, well, <laughs> ethics uh, is so much messier than mathematics. And so, uh, and so you know, uh, ethical methodology will, uh, will be much, uh, much messier. Uh, it is, you know, in, in ethics, it is more like an incredible, there's an incredible amount 
of or number of methodologies that can apply in ethics you know in ethics there are way more disagreements about reasons for for actions or beliefs than there will ever be in mathematics so maybe a more appropriate analogy still in the domain of mathematics uh, is would be set theory you know where despite you know established methods disagreements and uncertainties persist uh, hence, Skellen is telling us to think about ethics and reasons in the same way as we, as mathematicians, would think about set theory. Uh, sure, we won't be, uh, we won't be a general, or we won't have a general or unified theory like the, like there is in set theory, due to how much diversity we find in ethical reasoning. But as Skellen says in a footnote, the question at issue is not, however, whether there could be such a theory, but whether there are methods for settling questions about reasons that are sufficiently stable and reliable to support the idea that these are questions about which one can be correct or incorrect. So for Skellen, the diversity we find in ethics due to the substantive grounds uh, involved in morality, uh, again, substantive means that you have to take into account the concrete uh, circumstances of individuals, that, that often reinforces the, the doubts that we can um, the doubts that we can ever reach any uh, anything objective about morality, but Skellen persists into saying that most of these doubts arise from an obsession over metaphysical and epistemological status of reasons, which we, in the reality, we don't really need. So then Skellen turns to the next section of this uh, first chapter, which is about setting the methodology for finding and assessing reasons. So. How do I know what reasons we have? How do I know that the things I take as reasons for my beliefs or actions are actually reasons? So one way to start is by asserting that when one has a reason for doing something, we say that they have something in mind that would advance some aim or purpose one has. Um, like if, if my aim is to teach, uh, if my aim is to teach philosophy, for example, then I have reasons to read books of philosophy. These are called instrumental reasons, and we will start with those. It's when you say that adopting it, uh, intention B, for example, would allow me to carry intention A, and since I want intention A to be carried, then I have reasons to adopt intention B, unless I come to see uh, A as not worth striving for anymore. But the real problem on our hands is the one we've seen with already with, with Todd May. We don't have the time to do well everything that is worthwhile, so to be selective is the essence of practical reasoning. We're going to, uh, to need to know which things among uh, the things worthwhile are actually, you know, worthwhile or the most worthwhile. Um, Skellen says that this can either uh, happen consciously or unconsciously. We can either uh, do the choosing actively or we can do it passively. Um, advertising feeds on the second kind. Of course, it attracts our attention and when our attention is attracted, well, whatever, uh, whatever caught our, intention, uh, our attention will be, you know, considered worthwhile. Problem is when the things that attract your attention, like the attention directed uh, desires we explained last time, it can overrule things that are actually worthwhile. When studying, I can unreflectively uh, consider, you know, strolling on uh, social media, uh, on social media worthwhile, but that would be at the expense of, you know, study, studying for tomorrow's test. If I were immortal, it won't be a problem, but since I am not, well, it is, you know. Check the videos I made on Todd May's book, Death, huh? because, you know, it explains everything about uh, about what I, what I just said. Um, so, in other words, these, uh, attentions and intentions that arise, uh, they can alter my reasons. I was going to study, but then something pop, uh, pops up and it changes my reasons for studying. And now I'm looking at, you know, extracts from, I don't know, Friends or The Big Bang Theory or whatever sitcom uh, they have, you know, uh, clips, uh, clips of on, uh, on YouTube. And so this is also true about our beliefs. Skellen notes that there, uh, that like, like we don't have time for all kinds of actions, we also don't have the time to believe everything that is true. 
there are just too many true beliefs and they uh, they are changing constantly and so uh, keeping track of their evolution is almost impossible so even if uh, even in belief even in belief we are uh, we have to be selective and so both the action and belief uh, we consider you know worthwhile have to be selected if there is a selection it means that there has to be reasons for why we select those uh, those actions or beliefs and not others if the selection is done unreflectively well we know what kind of results that can lead to so it is also important that we select which actions or beliefs should uh, should be under our reflective awareness and which one we can leave for the unreflective parts of, uh, of ourselves and so again it would be absurd to demand that we'd, we'd be always aware or in, uh, or in control over uh, you know over our reasons so we need to secure the most important stuff for the reflective part and the trivial for maybe the unreflective and this is where the instrumentality of reason meets its limits obviously instrumental reasons are only limited with carrying on some goals but they don't tell us if those goals are the right ones Quote, selecting something as an end by adopting an intention to pursue it does not, uh, does not make the thing better or more valuable than the other worth, uh, worthy alternatives. It just gives a particular role in the agent's practical reasoning. So we have to do a selection of the most important stuff beyond the sphere, the sphere of uh, instrumentality. We need another criteria for judging if it is worthwhile to have certain aims. Wanting to do something, to uh, believe something, and therefore being looking for what kind of reasons would lead me to those goals without asking the question if those goals are worth, uh, are worth it in the first place is kind of self-defeating. So it would also mean that the aim or purpose that I have is also itself a reason to pursue it since for, uh, for it being my aim or purpose, it has to be worth striving for. So the question becomes, how do I know which things are worth seeking? Like what makes philosophy worth striving for, for example, in my case? What reasons do I have for wanting to become a philosopher? Now, here we have to distinguish between considerations that are reasons and one that seem like reasons. Like we've already argued with uh, with eating uh, with eating ice cream, the uh, the pleasure that I would get from eating the ice cream can seem to be a reason, but in reality, what well, is the pre uh, the, the is the pleasure a reason for me to eat ice cream? Or what about when parents are fed up with their kids uh, with their kids that the parents you know uh, take that attitude to be a reason for for example hitting or slapping their kids? So the issue with seeming is that uh, they can be persistent like desires and resist our judgments. Often we act out on things we thought to be reasons for acting, but then when we reflect about them, unlike you know, a parent who hits a child because you know, the child was misbehaving, when we reflect about that, we realize that you know, we were wrong to take whatever motivated us to act in a certain way for, a, for an actual reason to uh, you know to uh, to act you know like that the uh, that the, per the, the, the the annoyance that the that the parent for example feels when the child misbehave uh, when we reflect on it turns out it's not a good reason you know for for me to to hit my kid or to slap my kid so people who act out on anger for example may have the impression that they have good reasons to be angry at someone but once they calm down and think about their reasons, they realize that they overreacted or that their attitude was unwarranted and that it was, you know, independent of their judgment, meaning that it wasn't a reason at all. So, Scanlon proposes a four-stage uh, process for a reason to form and anything that we would take as a reason that didn't follow this process, well, it's not a reason. So for a consideration to be a reason, 
First, there has to be the seeming, like first uh, a consideration X seems or seems not to be a reason. The second stage is where the critical activity starts. This is when I start assessing uh, if that consideration actually is a reason or not at all. In the third stage, after knowing that X is a reason, I now decide whether or not it is a reason to be included in my account for justifying a belief or an action. Like I evaluate, like I evaluate if there is sufficient reason to adopt it or not. And finally, I develop an attitude, meaning that I form an intention to carry out the belief or the action. So in the case of the ice cream, first the idea of the pleasure, uh, the pleasure of eating it pops up. Then I assess if it is a reason or not a reason at all. Then I ask myself, should I include this reason uh, within my plan to form an intention? And finally, if the answer to the previous, uh, the previous stage was yes, then I now have the intention for going for some ice cream. So it is the third stage it is in the stage that rationality of the rationality of an agent is, you know, well uh, apparent because it is there uh, when a rational agent decides, uh, stage three, that there is sufficient reason to form an intention. Uh, stage four normally follows as a result. So we have seeming the first critical stage, the second critical stage, and then intention. So the critical stage is where it's all going to play out. Uh, it's uh, the first critical stage. Uh, the, the first critical stage is equally important because this is when we uh, this is when we ask the question of on what grounds do I consider the pleasure as a reason for ice cream and not as you know something something else. How can I distinguish between reasons and non reasons in that stage? How do I know that pleasure? is you know uh is 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 my reason before you know assessing if it is a reason worthy of being included in my intentions you know uh i, I first have to identify you know the pleasure as a reason and then ask if it is a good reason or not so in skellen's words what grounds can i have for deciding that i was mistaken to think that something was a reason how can i be justified in calling this a process of correction rather than merely a change in my reaction so uh, likewise we can ask is the bad behavior of a child a reason for you to strike them or did you strike them out of a reaction you know, this is what is meant by independent uh, of judgment. It's when the decision of striking your kid didn't come from a process of assessing if it, uh, if it is correct or incorrect to consider striking a kid an aim and to consider, you know, their bad behavior uh, as, you know, a reason to, uh, to strike them or a sufficient reason to strike them. So here the process of correction goes through multiple questions like uh, is it a reason? What kind of reason would it be? Is violence appropriate because it creates fear or shows your uh, your power? Why is that desirable? Uh, is it su supposed to be good for the child or simply to demonstrate something about you? Uh, if if the latter, what does that imply or signify about your relations with the child? If it is the former, why think uh, why think that the effects will be good? On, uh, on the kid, what alternatives are there, and uh, what would their effects be, etc. Like all, you have all of these questions, and so without this conscious and active process, then we'd simply be well reacting to our environment, uh, reacting mindlessly. You know, uh, we'd simply be reacting if we strike if we strike our child. You know, that was just a reaction to their behavior. So. It is like you test the seeming to see if it stands this uh, examination, or is it, you know, uh, for of uh, you know this examination of is it a reason or not? Quote: If your initial tendency to think that the child's insolent behavior gives you reason to strike it stands after this examination, then you conclude that it really is a reason. If it does not, then you conclude that it is not. Now, someone can ask, uh, this doesn't reveal anything about what we are after. Uh, like, did the bad behavior of the kid uh, 
really, uh, really was a reason or not to strike them. If we conclude that it is not, someone can still ask, well, did we really apply the test? Like, did we really correct our judgment or did we conclude that it is not a reason out of a reaction to? You know, why should uh, regard this conclusion as a correction of the initial tendency and not as a reaction as well? You know, so these, uh, so there are two reasons to say that what we did was a correction and not a reaction. First, the conclusion, bad behavior is never uh, a reason to hit my kid, can be supported and accounted for uh, by you know, more evidence, uh, with more clarity and more common sense than the one that concludes that it is okay to hit your kid because of their bad behavior. And the second reason is that such reflection is less likely to be, well, distorted by your rage. The conclusion is, uh, it, is uh, it is a reason to hit my child if they uh, behave badly is easily compatible with a state of rage which is more likely to cloud or obscure your judgment. Like we said, when we act out on anger, we are more likely to be reacting than correcting our judgments and you know, our beliefs. The conclusion, it is not a reason on the other hand, resists our rage and therefore demands that we control ourselves and focus on our judgment. And so likewise, we need to go for the best explanation that cannot be rejected. If you say that, you were in a bad mood because you didn't eat well or you didn't have breakfast or you were, you know, hangovered and this gave you a reason to hit a screaming uh, child, you know it is a reason because it can, e you know it is not a reason, sorry, you know it is not a reason because it can easily be rejected. And the easier it is to be rejected, the closer it is to being arbitrary and meaningless, so it would be a reaction, you know. As Scanner writes, a reason is a consideration that counts in favor of some judgment-sensitive attitude, and the content of that attitude must provide some guidance in identifying the kinds of considerations that could uh, count in favor of it. If it does not, then the question of whether something is a reason for it will make no sense, and any answer will seem truly arbitrary. So this would apply that we have what Scanlon calls background substantive judgments that would allow us to determine if acting out under anger is a bad thing uh, or not. That, uh, that, what, uh, you, uh, that whether you had breakfast, uh, breakfast or what you had for breakfast cannot be a reason to hit uh, to hit uh, you know to, uh, to hit to hit someone. You know you already have that background judgment. We need to make reasons that don't, you know, sound arbitrary based on solely our moods or interests by judging if our moods are relevant reason in particular situations. So in the situation of looking at paintings in an art, uh, in an art uh, gallery, my pleasure at looking at art can be appropriate to explain my presence at the art gallery. But if I'm going to use my pleasure as a reason for why we cannot uh, change the art of a certain gallery, like uh, if I'm going to use my taste as a reason not to change the art expositions, then I'll come off of, some, of someone who is weird and perhaps you know delusional or dangerous. You know? uh, so I need these background judgments as well that you know tell me that rage isn't reliable to make decisions, that my tastes or moods can, cannot always be a good enough reason. Um, if I was to justify the preservation of natural parks, for example, because they are beautiful, it's not sufficient, since the reason why we preserve natural parks is also because we care about the environment for other reasons than just its beauty. So when people question these judgments, like, uh, for example, I, I, like, uh, I like Van Gogh, so every art gallery must have a Van Gogh painting or else I'll sabotage, the, I'll sabotage them. Well, I have to think about what I am missing here. You know, what kind of reasons can there be for not wanting just Van Gogh or for wanting to preserve, you know, animal life other than the pleasure that, that, we, that we get when looking at, you know, natural landscapes? What factors am I missing if I don't... Uh, if I don't see, you know, those, those other reasons. What is it that others, for example, others see as reasons and I don't? You know, if someone sees a reason for preserving a natural, a natural, uh, a natural park other 
than just you know the beauty of trees or the beauty of nature then you know i have to ask myself what what that reason can be so scan and quote nigel here who describes this method in the following if we start by regarding appearances of value as appearances of something and then step back from uh, two from hypotheses about the broader system of motivational possibilities of which we have had a glimpse the result is a gradual opening out of a complex domain which we apparently discover the method of discovery is to seek the best normative explanation of the normative appearance uh, appearances sorry so that's the method that Scanlon is advocating for. You look for the best normative explanation possible. If you cannot find it, and whenever you think about you know, doing, uh, doing something, you systematically think that it can be rejected, it either means that you have to keep looking for a better explanation, or you just realize that it is not something worth doing and you should move on to something else. So this would mean that someone who does something wrong is someone who probably didn't consider everything there is to consider and which is available to him. Again, if someone did something based on everything that he had at that time in mind uh, or everything that he had you know, at, uh, at their disposal, but it turned out that the thing was bad, well, that person cannot really be blamed. We don't blame children, for example, when they behave badly because we know that they didn't know better and they couldn't have known better. They didn't have access to other information or the faculties that would make them look beyond themselves, for example. Uh, they don't have, you know, the, the, the faculties to, to have a relevant access. Uh, access to, to further information or to uh, assess correctly uh, that information from the point of view of an adult, you know, but it is still correct from their point of view as children. So if you are going to blame someone, you have to blame them on their own level, on their own grounds and on their own circumstances. Would it be reasonable to steal when one hasn't eaten for days because of poverty? Well, probably yes. Would it be reasonable to do it because you are looking for a thrill? Eh, probably not. Because this person has everything that they already need to see that they shouldn't steal. If they did, then they are mistaken in their reasoning about reasons. So mistakes occur according... Now, here he goes back to, uh, to Gilbert Harman, uh, which we already mentioned in uh, a previous video. Um, so these mistakes, they occur when one can be careless or inattentive. One can forget about relevant consideration or fail to give it sufficient weight. One can make mistakes in long, uh, in long division. One can fail to see something, to remember something, to attend carefully, and so on. So Skellen gives an example with someone who, uh, who agrees on uh, what we call the, the, the gambler's fallacy, which states that if a fair coin has been flipped six times and it was head six times in a row, the probability that it would be, uh, that it would be you know, heads another time, so heads seven times in a row, is pretty low. So I bet, uh, uh, so I bet that, it will come, uh, to, that it will turn tails. But this is a fallacy, because, I mean, the probability uh, coming heads the seventh time is still 50%, you know. So here Scanlon calls this a failure of noticing relevant distinction, which, of course, it is... If it is a failure, then it means that I could have noticed it. But now that I've seen it, my new belief would be stronger and more stable, and even if, you know, in some circumstances I'd be tempted again by the fallacy, if there are high stakes on the gamble, for example, if I feel pressure because, you know, my friends would tease me if I get the, foreign, uh, if, if I get the, the, the coin flip wrong again, etc. But like the example of what I ate for breakfast and a reason to hit your kid, the peer pressure or, you know, the high stakes aren't reason to commit the fallacy again. So my stability come, becomes a way of countering those uh, circumstances and not let them turn me from a reasoning, correcting being to a reacting being. And the fact that this stability is based on judgments that can be, you know, widespread, that most people would agree upon, uh, highlights them even more. Um, of course, ethics are messy and too diverse, but 
We can find a lot of background judgments that are common to most people and therefore their commonality would serve as a way to strengthen them. Considering that something is pleasant or exciting or required by duty or loyalty, etc. can be a reason to act in a certain way. And so this methodology of the four stages and looking for the best explanation as well as the most stable belief or reasons for actions is dependent on interpersonal agreements between individuals. Hence the inclusive nature of this method. We need others to challenge, you know, or to support our reasons in order for us to distinguish good reasons from bad reasons and leaving enough room for everyone to disagree. Quote, all of this taken together provides ample uh, ground for saying that judgments about reasons for actions are the kind of things uh, that can be correct or incorrect, uh, incorrect, even though there are many cases in which we may continue to disagree as to which of these uh, is the case. Now, this method, and Skellen is, is aware of this, can be similar to a coherence theory of reason. Uh, since what uh, would make reasons acceptable is what the agent uh, knows and what's available to them, their circumstances, their moods, etc., it would seem that it is not much the truth value of the reason that determines its validity, but the coherence of all of these elements once they are taken together. In other words, it doesn't matter if your reasons are true or false in themselves because their truth value is just derived from their coherence. So there are a few problems with the theory of co coherence, notably its conservatism since it requires, uh, since it, uh, it relies on background judgments to assess the validity of a reason. Uh, a coherence theory of value can become an obstacle to moral progress since it can and maybe Maybe some of you thought of this as you watch this video, um, that the coherence theory can make seem false moral uh, claims coherent. You know, like after all, it seemed coherent for the ancient Egyptians to hold slaves, right? It seems coherent to many people still today that women should be submissive to men. If my reasons depend on my previous frameworks, then as Kellen says, if his method was really a coherent theory, then he'd be endorsing a complacent reaffirming, a reaffirmation of whatever we happen to think. But Skellen rejects this, saying that this method isn't a coherence theory, since as he explained, uh, those background judgments are also subject to criticism and can of course change as many of them do as we grow old. At, at all times I can encounter something or someone who would provide me with a new piece of evidence that would challenge those background judgments or show me, uh, show me that they can't support the reasons that I want them to support. So being partial to one's family for example can be a background judgment for lying in order to protect uh, my brother, but that's a judgment open to criticism. If when I present my case for why I lied and someone rejects reasonably my reasons, then the problem is solved. Well, whether I was mistaken or provided the best explanation I really could think of doesn't make me immune to criticism. Maybe immune to blame in the latter case, but I'm always open to criticism no matter what. So even if I manipulate people, like I know that my reasons aren't enough to justify my acts, but I went along with it, believing that no one would see through me, uh, then I'm mistaken. I failed to see or consider some reasons that would have proved that this is a bad strategy. And so this means that in order to criticize those same judgments, people would have to use the method of skeleton, since they have to ask why I lied and why I'm going to, uh, why I try to manipulate them. And so I'm going to have to provide my reasons that, you know, he is my brother, uh, he's my, his family, and people will show me if that, if that is a good enough reason for lying or not. Or I can convince them that in those circumstances, lying was the best, the, uh, the best reason I could think of. So as Scanlon himself puts it, we cannot establish in this way that we must accept the judgments about reasons that we do hold. All that can be uh, established is that they seem, on reflection, to be correct. That, it seems to me, is enough and as much as one could reasonably ask for. And so another objection 
he may uh, he may raise is that when uh, is that is that the coherence theory of truth uh, because it cannot establish or secure one definite truth can be vulnerable to skepticism and relativism that would you know state that everyone can make their own theory of uh, of coherence and so it is true if i fool the audience i am technically missing on something but i'm just taking a risk here which means that uh that there is a chance that i can get away with it you know i can fool people into believing that i am coherent i can use my power to make sure people don't get the means or tools to contradict me ideology works like that after all right we can also add that there are many instances where systems of coherence are equally valid despite being mutually exclusive what can we do then if there if there isn't a notion of truth that would settle all the disputes in such cases so both in the case of me fooling the audience and the case where two coherent views are clashing but both are valid would be solved by a higher notion of truth that exists independently of people's substantive reasons but then would be out of contractualism and Scalin insists that we stay in contractualism because outside of it will probably end up creating a religion and we know how that goes but that would be the point of contractualism to go beyond like i would by fooling or using power to prevent you from developing the tools to contradict me wouldn't be ethical and that would be you know condemned by scanlon's method like you know the the Scanlon's method is a criticism to people fooling you because well objectively you owe your reasons to others including the ones uh including the ones why you fool them you know, including also the reasons why you fool them. So there is within contractualism a dimension that is beyond contractualism. And as for the second cases, where Scanlon, uh, here Scanlon uh, uh, simply says that cases of equally blind allies are rare and uh, blind allies, sorry, blind allies are rare and eventually the world, I mean, the world changes, circumstances change, and therefore one party will eventually come off as more coherent than the other. Saying that if we reach such such cases, then, then that's it, we're done. It's like, you know, taking human disagreement and turn them into metaphysical cosmic battles that are, you know, outside of time and, uh, and space. So theoretical disagreements can be like that, eternal battles of irreconcilable concepts, but we're not uh, in a theor theoretical disagreement, but in practical reasonings, because we are talking about ethics. You know, our disagreements are about practical things, not about theoretical stuff. So if two positions get stuck, then they're purely theoretical. They are purely formal without any content. If such In, in such cases, these would be, you know, lab, uh, labeled coherent theories, and that's why Scanlon rejects this label for his uh, method. So he follows the philosopher Richard Brand, who said, There is no reason to think that a more coherent set of beliefs is better justified than a less coherent one, unless some of the beliefs are initially credible and not merely initially believed, for some reason other than their coherence, say, because they state facts of observation. And so, Scanlon agrees that there has to be more than just coherence to justify our reasons. Our reasons must also have a side to them that is like observation. Like our reasons need to be factual as well instead of just formal. Like it, just, it, it is just about the form of the argument. You know, your reason have a coherent form and so that's it. But this is what uh, Scanlon rejects. But he diverged with uh, with brand on what constitutes an observation it is uh, i mean in the case of brand his observation would amount to natural facts and we've already covered that problem so for scanlon it would be more appropriate to say that our reasons and judgments quote have a high degree of confidence on re uh, on rejection uh, on rejection are like observe are like observations in having independent credibility even though they are not like observations in seeming to report on some physical realm that is uh, at a distance from us so in other words 
In cases of a tie of this kind, we just have to keep arguing until eventually someone's epistemo uh, epistemology will be superior to the others. That's why he says they have to be like observations, you know, but they're not observations about the natural or physical world. Uh, quote, this difference between, uh, between us may be due in turn to the fact that different information or experience is available to our two groups, in which, case, uh, in which case we need to consider which of our positions is epistemologically superior. Does the information or experience that uh, they have give us reasons to mistrust our own reactions? If so, then some revision is called for on our part. If not, then we have reason to uh, stick with our system of reasons. So we just basically we just keep it up until eventually some side will get the upper hand because you know the chances of this going on eternally are pretty slim. And so again, people and circumstances change. And if uh, someone is holding to their system of reason out of habit, well, depending on your scale, habits eventually you know they eventually fade and you know they eventually you know are changed with uh, with new ones. So when considered things as a whole, it rarely seems that things are that static. You know, some side is bound to uh, to bringing something uh, something new or something more, which will make their system of reason more reasonable or more coherent than uh, than the uh, than the other. And so this brings us to uh, to the idea of other people's reasons. Why do people have different reasons from us and from each other? Uh, obviously because they have different circumstances, because they have different interests and intentions, and also because they can be mistaken about their reasons while maybe others are not mistaken about theirs. So in, Scanlon, in Scanlon's terms, mistaken means not just mistaken about what will promote their ends, but mistaken in having those ends to begin with. And so this kind of assertions can be scary to some because they can, they, they can take criti criticizing others' reasons for a way to tell them what to think or to decide for them their reasons, which is, you know, always suspicious. Like it comes off uh, as me, you know, lying to protect my brother and impose my reasons on others, right? Like I tell others to, uh, to forcibly accept my reasons because it suits my interests. And so, while that can be true, it is also important to remember that the only way for people to care and respect the reasons of others is by others being open to rational criticism, and so, and so do we. So this is because our own reasons, unless you want to pretend that everyone's reason is valid, and so you bring us back to the issue of having equally uh, valid reasons, uh, our reasons affect others because our reasons determine how we will treat others. So we must be concerned with other people's reasons. Quote, we must be concerned insofar as we take ourselves to have any reasons at all, since any judgment about our own reasons entails claims about the reasons that others have or would have in, in certain circumstances. And so here's an example from Scanlon that illustrates how a woman, let's call her Jane, perceives a reason to help her neighbor uh, shovel snow based on certain factors. Uh, let's call them, you know, a, a, set, uh, a set G. Like, she sees that the guy is painting and uh, painting and still has a lot uh, of snow to, uh, to shovel. And so these factors could Include, uh, include, you know, her care for her neighbor, personal enjoyment in helping, or anticipating, uh, anticipation, uh, or an anticipation of, you know, needing her neighbor's assistance in the future. And so, regardless of the specific factors in this G set, if Jane uh, believes she has a reason to help, she is also committed to the idea that anyone else in a similar position with a similar factor in the G set has a reason to provide help as well. Like if I too share, you know, that, that same set as, as Jane, then Jane and I would both believe that I too must help my neighbor in similar circumstances and that everyone who shares G 
must also do the same. If you agree with, you know, the, the factors in the G set and you happen to have a neighbor who is, you know, shoveling snow, then like me and Jane, you also have reason to help your neighbor. And so this concept is referred to as the universality of reason judgments. And it applies regardless of whether reasons are rooted in personal desires or other considerations. And it stands independent of debates about subjective conditions for reasons. In other words, it is universal because it states that in all situations in which G is appropriate, one must follow G no matter what other reasons they can have. Okay? If the reasons they have would, uh, would make G inappropriate, then you know they don't have to follow G. But if they don't have any reason that would make G inappropriate in that situation, well, they have to follow G. They have to help their neighbors. And so in the situation of Jane, if she doesn't go to help her neighbor because she's too cozy in her warm living room and doesn't want to be, uh, to be cold for a few hours, that is not a sufficient reason to throw away G. Even if she's not, you know, a moral person, she still has to follow G because it is a universal principle. But of course, if she has, you know, some sort of disease that would uh, that would make it impossible for her to uh, to stay in the cold for a few hours, then you know that would be a reason that would make G inappropriate. But in the absence of special justification, well, G applies. So if Jane doesn't help her neighbor, or I don't, uh, or I don't help my neighbor, while me and Jane share G, we are both entitled to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, I mean, other people, I mean, the neighbor and other people are entitled to demand that Jane or me explain our uh, ourselves and so provide reasons for why we didn't help the neighbor, and so. The, uh, <clears throat> the result can be that Jane does have a good reason that would rule out G, or that I too have a good reason to rule it out. But that, can, but that can only be possible if we agree to test our beliefs and reasons and see if indeed G holds in that particular situation, or if we have to adopt another principle in that situation. So when we judge our own reasons, we are also making claims about the reasons that other people have or would have in specific situations. Therefore, we have self-interested motivations for forming opinions about the accuracy of other people's judgments regarding their own reasons. I need to be sure about what, uh, what Jane's reasons for helping or not helping her neighbor, given that I, uh, I thought that we both share G. You know, like maybe Jane has something to do uh, that is urgent or cannot afford to waste time by helping her neighbor. And so this can lead to situations where if their assessments of their reasons for action are correct, our own assessments of our reasons might be incorrect. So for such conflicts uh, to be uh, for such conflicts to be to be meaningful, both parties must be evaluating the same thing such as, you know, whether specific considerations genuinely support a particular stance for a person in a given situation. This implies that they must be uh, discussing the same perspective and using similar sets of evaluative criteria. Or to put it differently, when I am forming my reasons for beliefs and actions, I must form them on the grounds that others can agree with them use them if they encounter the same situation as myself and also understand them. And so reasons are basically like tools. Um, like a, a moral philosopher is someone who makes concepts, in this case ethical reasons, and he then displays them in some sort of shop where people can come in and let's say they, they take them uh, or they buy them, whatever, for the sake uh, for the sake of the analogy, uh, because you know they've encountered situations in which those reasons appropriately apply. And so this means that the philosopher must be thinking of other people when he makes these tools, so that they, uh, so that they can serve others. When people display a hammer in, uh, in their shop, for example, it is because they know that eventually someone is going to need a hammer. 
and that person will know that what they what they need is a hammer because they've seen other people use hammers in similar situations etc same thing with ethical concepts and so as Scanlon says since we acquire the concepts involved in such judgment chiefly by imitating others it is to be expected that in our process of selecting from among uh, the range of features and distinctions which might be noticed those to which reason giving uh, reason giving significance is to be attached we will generally settle on ones that others around us already recognize and see as important so the fact that i see some people use the hammer on uh, on the g principle then i'm inclined to wonder what is good about that hammer what makes those reasons good reasons for these people they certainly are valuable from their point of view, at least, for adopting them, so it is worthwhile that I, too, consider adopting them. So, let's examine them. I can ask them why they believe that they, uh, why they believe that, you know, they, uh, why they believe what they believe, <laughs> you know, and see if, uh, if that makes, if that makes sense. Like, when you ask the seller to help you decide which hammer would help you uh, would help you the most and you can either agree or disagree or ask for more information if you're not uh, convinced etc either way caring about people's beliefs uh, has major benefits you know they might be correct and i might learn something from them if i am you know convinced by a theorem but someone who is more knowledgeable than me disagrees with that theorem then i have good reasons to listen for their reasons for reasons for this uh, for disagreeing if i think that some art is ugly for example but a friend thinks that it is beautiful and interesting then i can be interested in their reasons for thinking that you know what am i missing what is it that they see and and that i don't what is it that they see in the painting and i am missing here we know we deal with epistemological stories to use uh, to use uh, gibbard's terminology it is a story of how and why someone came to adopt a certain knowledge and these stories can be compared to each other in a relative sense some can be you know inferior or superior to others like if in my story i explain that i that i had some sort of trauma that makes me you know not want to look at a painting so i developed an epistemology uh, an epistemology based on that experience someone can have a story in which they too suffered a similar trauma as mine but they don't look at the painting in the same way but rather see it in a therapeutic way or to cope with uh, with their trauma so here it is in my interest to ask what it is that i missed uh, I mean, they, uh, they were able to form another principle that obviously took my principle into consideration and kind of transcended it, you know, so they must have seen something that I didn't. And so in this situation, I have reason to care about the other person's reasons. I chose an example of trauma, but it can be a simple epistemology, you know, like someone has a better scientific methodology than mine. Like, you know, his method gets him results quickly while mine needs to go through long, unnecessary operations. So I can also have reasons to care about other uh, people's reasons, because if there is a consensus on those reasons in the wider population, then those reasons will affect me and they will affect how I live. So here too, the example of science is significant because methodology in science works by consensus within, you know, the scientific community. Or like the example provided by Scanlon, when you are a skater and see that plenty of other skaters have more fluid techniques than you do, you have to consider why they have that technique and what, it, what is its benefits in competition because they can beat you with that technique. And so Scanlon also uses his own field, philosophy, as an example. He writes, similarly, in philosophy, if others in my field start writing in a new way, for example, by giving greater importance in their writings to facts about the social context in which various philosophical ideas arise, then I have reason to understand what they are doing and why they think that these matters are philosophically important, if only in order to be able to participate in debates and perhaps influence the development of the subject in a direction I would prefer. So... 
we care about those things not because we want to uh, compete but also because we want to belong having you know shared reasons and principles would allow me to have stable stable uh, stable uh, stable uh, you know relationships and ties with these communities whenever uh, whether it is a scientific community a uh, sports community religious artistic philosophical the fact that we can have common reasons secures our bounds so if recognition of values uh, begin you know uh, recognition of values begins to diverge this would of course affect our relationship with one another it if some uh, if some for example start to doubt the reasons supporting our core beliefs or we differ on the reasons supporting those beliefs, I will be affected by this, and our relationships can be threatened. Indeed, if some start to doubt in the sense, they'll be, they'll be less likely to invest in the community or activity, and eventually it can lead to the community's disintegration. And so in such cases, it is important that both parties, that both parties settle down and discuss the matter. Like, why would someone start doubting our reasons? Maybe they have good reasons to doubt. Maybe we can learn something. Maybe they've seen something that we've been missing. Maybe we're hurting them without even knowing it, etc. So this also has a big role to play in why we should care about others' reasons. It will also show, uh, it will also show us how the others value us and how we value them. And so in this case, if I'm the one doubting the reasons of the community, if the community responds with hostility, if the community doesn't consider my rights, for example, to have different reasons, that they refuse to see my point and that they uh, ostracize me or maybe oppress me, then it shows that they don't value me, they don't value my individuality or my independence. If I realize that the only reason uh, the group has to care about me was that I have to share their own reasons uh, and that I cannot disagree or diverge uh, like they care as uh, like they, they care about you as long as you are obedient uh, this is good grounds for me to consider my ties with the, to reconsider my ties with these uh, with these people because obviously their reasons uh, affect me deeply and in a bad way so as Kellen says quote uh, <clears throat> because this difference matters, you have reason to care about the reasons others take themselves to be governed by in deciding how to treat you. And so we arrive at the conclusion of this first chapter. So let's summarize what we've seen so far. So first, Scanlon wanted to take reason in its most primitive sense and building his argument from there, his argument was that what we consider right or wrong depends on our reasons for such considerations. Considerations have to depend on the reasons because it is through reasons that we can communicate to others why we consider certain acts or belief to be right and others to be wrong. So this implies that questions of right or wrong are rational questions or more precisely reasonable questions. It means, you know, questions that we that we can evaluate, that we can assess, that we can judge uh, based on their practicality as much as their truth value. Um, after, he after that, he, uh, he explained what he means by rationality and by reasonableness and also justific justifiability, uh, meaning that an action or belief is good only if the reasons that support it cannot be rejected on reasonable grounds. And so he went on to the problem of desires. And we talked about that in the last video. Uh, we went through Scanlon's argument to discredit desires as reasons. Uh, the reason why people would take desires to be a primary motivational force in ethics is because people think that it would be irrational for someone to have a desire and fail to act out on it uh, without an authority blocking his desire, uh, desire's fulfillment. And so Scanlon uh, refuses this account by rectifying what is meant by irrationality. So for him, irrationality isn't failing to act out on a desire, uh, since for him, desires don't have the motivational force uh, that, come, that come with reasons. Instead, irrationality would be failing to act out on reasons that one has accepted and assessed, not failing to acknowledge or accept, uh, or you know, failing to, uh, 
to, uh, to acknowledge or accept those reasons. So he explains that desires cannot be the source of motivation or for justification, and so reasons are better, uh, they are better candidate for, the, for that since reasons can be on their own sufficient for justification and motivation without you know, relying on desires or adding some sort of uh, another, another weird force uh, to, uh, to justify our motivation. The problem then uh, simply becomes of a methodology to assess those reasons, uh, which is what Scannon has provided in, in, this, uh, in this current video. Uh, we offered a method of four stages. Uh, we said that first there is seeming, where things appear to be uh, reasons. Then you have the first critical stage in which you determine if it is a reason or not. The second critical stage we determine if it is a good reason or, or not. And then you have the intention, which is the fourth uh, stage, where we form our plan to carry out our reasons. And so the success of this method also depends on our relationship with others, especially about the reasons of, uh, of others. Since other people's reasons affect us, we need to think about those reasons as well as their implications for our own reasons and our own behavior. And so that's it for the first, uh, the first chapter. I will see you next week for the second chapter. Of